so often I think when we come to Mass, we battle that kind of inattentiveness and distractions that can affect us. And I think, sadly, maybe sometimes we come here and the, the readings or the prayers seem distant and just not connected to us. But hopefully, I think sometimes, something does touch us in a most tangible and relevant insight. And I would propose to you the event that we just heard in today's gospel. As with last Sunday's gospel with the parable of the prodigal son, present to us a most relevant insight because they speak to us of a most important reality in our lives. And that is the continuous offer that God gives to us of his mercy. Remember last week we spoke a little bit about the three figures in that parable of the prodigal son, the forgiving father who shows us how God forgives us. Now we are then meant to forgive one another. The son, how he confidently seeks to come back and receive the father's mercy how that represents what you and I are supposed to do in the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. And then even the older son who is faithful like most of us are, but who faces that moment of truth, uncertain of again that irrational generosity of the father. In this gospel we have two figures or a figure and a group of figures who both encounter Christ and again, the event speaks us of this most important truth of our faith, which is the infinite mercy of God. Of course, the woman caught in adultery represents each and every one of us. <laughs> she is a sinner, as you and I are. She's brought before the Lord and she stands there helpless and afraid unlike the prodigal son when we are told that he came to his senses and made that resolution to come and to express his forgiveness to his heavenly father, she has not done so because this has happened all too fast for her. She's there standing filled with shame and guilt and fear at this inevitable stoning that she awaits. The scribes and the Pharisees can also represent us sometimes, what we call maybe our darker selves. When we sometimes judge too quickly, or we seek vengeance, when we maybe focus only on what we think should be the outcome that should come to a situation. But of course, they are even worse. They're trying to trick the Lord. They're trying to somehow get him in a corner because if he agrees with their judgment of stoning, then he will have abandoned his teachings of mercy. And yet if he disagrees with them about what is due to the woman, then he will have violated Jewish teaching. Again, we have to allow our imagination to picture this scene for us. It is a most chaotic and frantic one. The woman is screaming as she's brought into the temple area. The scribes and the Pharisees comprise this angry and zealous mob. Undoubtedly, the crowd is coming forward also yelling. And what does Jesus do? <laughs> we are told that he bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. Now, there's much speculation as to what this means or symbolizes. We can think of when the hand of God inscribed the law on the tablets to Moses. Some scholars refer to Jeremiah where he says those who have abandoned the Lord here, the Pharisees, their names will be written on the earth. Some modern writers have proposed that Jesus is writing out the sins of the Pharisees who stand there. But certainly whatever he does, he diffuses the situation. Amidst all the clamor and all the screaming, he pauses, <laughs> and therefore he causes all to pause with him. And then we are told that he straightens up, <laughs> and he says those now famous words, let the one among you who is without sin 
be the first to throw a stone at her. Can you imagine the shock of the Pharisees? The heart-wrenching response that this statement evokes. They have been consumed with their self-righteousness. They have this disordered desire to control Jesus. They have used the woman almost as a political tool to trick him without any regard for her humanity. But now Jesus calls them to look not to anybody else, <laughs> but to themselves and their sinfulness. And as I reflected upon this this week, I was especially struck by what St. John writes, how they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. <laughs> Certainly as I am getting older and older and now in that category, I see with greater clarity what they saw, which was their own sinfulness. But then there is this final dramatic scene. We're told again Jesus straightens up. And now this woman must be even more apprehensive and bewildered and confused, maybe somewhat relieved the crowd has left. Can you imagine how our Lord looks into her eyes and she looks into his and undoubtedly feels a power that can only come from God himself? Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replies, no one, sir, although she knows her guilt. And then Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. And here's the clear lesson for us. God is mercy. But his mercy is not mindless or dysfunctional. But it comes with a command and a call. Do not sin anymore. It's the call given to us in this conversion of Lent. It's why we are to come to the sacrament of penance to experience this incomparable gift of his mercy, our parish penance service this Tuesday night. And it is then how when we are tempted to judgment or to condemnation that we are to refrain from all of that because you and I are sinners. And one day you and I will stand before God like the woman in our gospel. And we will stand there naked with our own sinfulness. And we will stand there holy and dependent upon one thing and only one thing. And that is the infinite mercy of God. How blessed we are. May we in our kindness and our gentleness with one another also be blessings to them.